Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. It's that time of day. Time for the final session in what I'm sure has been a long day with lots of information uh, and ideas being exchanged. And of course, uh, this session is titled The Policy Impact of Revenue Authority Research in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm Denise Wall. If you were here yesterday, you do, do know that. And I think everyone in this room agrees that promoting fair and equitable tax systems is crucial for stable growth. That's because, as we all know, leakages drain much-needed resources and have the knock-on effect of weakening long-term sustainable development. And that's why improving the capacity for tax and other domestic revenue collection is a key target of SDG 17, which has to do with multi-stakeholder partnerships. In this afternoon's discussion, we want to focus the spotlight on the Global South, where many countries struggle with efficient tax revenue collection. We have a panel of experts who, I dare say, believe that research collaborations can help revenue authorities build stronger tax systems in sub-Saharan Africa to help promote more equitable and sustainable development in the region. Before we engage our panelists in the discussion at hand, though, I'd like to invite Professor Yuka Pirtila to background the session by providing an insight into the kinds of initiatives taking place at the institution, uh, that's UNU wider, and contributing to revenue authority collaboration in sub-Saharan Africa. Please, Yuka, and I will sort of give you a fanfare by talking about you for a bit. Yuka Pirtila is a professor of public economics at the University of Helsinki, and he also holds the position of non-resident senior research fellow at UNU Wider. He's previously worked for the University of Tampere, the Labour Institute for Economic Research, that's in Helsinki, uh, and the Bank of Finland. He conducts research on topics related to taxation and social protection in developing countries, and his research is widely published in journals such as the Journal of Public Economics, the Journal of Development Economics, the Economic Journal, and the European Economic Review. Yuka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for the kind introduction, and, and welcome to the session also from my behalf. Uh, uh, so we thought that um, uh, I would give uh, some background uh, to the, uh, for the session on, on uh, to sort of frame the discussion. So, uh, yes, I work together with the UNU wider colleagues and, 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 and several colleagues from African Revenue Authorities uh, uh, in utilizing tax data for research. Okay, so let me start off with the, uh, uh, providing you with the, some of the goals of our, our work. So, of course, I mean, uh, tax authorities need data, and they need data uh, to make, uh, uh, to actually then uh, uh, administer taxation, so levy taxes on the, on the firms and individuals. And this data is by design at the taxpayer level, so that's micro data. Uh, the information uh, uh, as, a, as a byproduct is also uh, useful for research purposes on, on looking at various issues in, in tax research and also perhaps more widely as well uh, 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 for, for understanding the economy. And, and, and this research uh, is, has main, mainly two objectives. The first one is to understand taxpayer behavior. So taxation, of course, is needed to uh, gather revenues, but it also influences uh, the economic agencies in many ways. So it can lead to uh, employment changes, it can lead to uh, changes in investment levels, and understanding these responses is crucial also from the revenue authority perspective. Uh, but of course, and this is of course the main goal uh, for the, the revenue authorities, uh, is to seek ways to improve tax compliance and reduce uh, uh, tax evasion. And, and big data and combining various data sources can also be helpful there. So I would, I would in a sense, summarize this slide saying that this is a combination of big micro-level administrative data and then the appropriate research designs 
that hopefully then provide credible research findings. So the style of the wider work uh, together with the revenue authorities is really to co-create research. So uh, uh, research topics that we have been working on, uh, the topics have been chosen jointly with the revenue authorities. Uh, for example, in the Zambian case, we, we learned that the Zambia Revenue Authority wanted to study wanted to have new estimates of the tax gap, and, and then we tried to I mean, estimate them uh, together with, the, with, with colleagues from ZRA. In order to do so, we need to have access to the data, and the data that researchers use uh, don't need to have the actual identifiers, uh, so the, it's anonymized what the researchers get, get access to, and then it's shared with the researchers in a secure manner. So we feel that there are synergies in this sort of uh, collaboration style, because it could be the case that the international researchers from the wider network can bring in some new, new fancy methodologies, but without the deep uh, uh, institutional knowledge that the local uh, researchers or, 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 or policymakers have, uh, the research findings wouldn't have relevance and, 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 and they could even be perhaps misleading. So I, we think that the, I mean, working together here is key. Uh, we have co-authored papers um, together with Revenue Authority and, and uh, 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 researchers and analysts and local academics as well. Uh, in top, on top of that co-authoring, uh, there have also been various sorts of actual capacity building uh, uh, act activities. So this is a map of Africa and it, uh, uh, and it highlights the countries uh, with um, whom UNU wider is conducting research uh, using tax administrative data and the, and the set of countries includes um, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, Uganda and Zambia. And, and then there are of course various other research projects going on with several other African countries but these are the tax administrative research uh, collaborating partners. Let me uh, talk a little bit more about two, um, two highlights of the joint research or capacity development work in the area of tax. The first is um, uh, our work together with the Uganda Revenue Authority in building a research lab. And the second is, uh, is a capacity development um, uh, initiative that, that UNU wider uh, ran uh, in 2022 uh, uh, together with Stellenbosch University and the Southern uh, uh, SA Tide uh, research program in South Africa. Okay, so the, so the data lab in Uganda. Uh, UU Wider has collaborated with Uganda Revenue Authority for more than five years. And during this collaboration, it became clear uh, that it would be in the interest of um, URA to, to open up data access uh, uh, more broadly. And, and that was why then uh, the two institutions decided to uh, uh, cooperate. And, and, uh, and, a, and a data set was prepared and was then made available in a secure facility in Kampala. Uh, there was a launch event uh, in 2022 uh, and, uh, and, and that was also then supported by a request for research proposals. So UNU wider gave some, uh, uh, some support for research teams utilizing the, the data set also because uh, the research team members had to, um, had to travel to Kampala to this physical lab to work on, on the data. And in fact, uh, some of the papers uh, selected uh, from that call have now been pre pre uh, uh, presented in this conference and some are available as wider working papers. And, 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 and so we are very grateful to the Uganda Revenue Authority for, for, for working together with us uh, to make this happen. And, and, and we are very keen on, on, on continuing uh, to develop further the lab and, and then do similar sort of activities going forward. Oops, now I need to get back. How do I do that? Thank you. <laughs> So I just wanted to show this. So this is the uh, so UNU wider has started 
this sort of making data, admin data available for the, um, for, the, uh, for the broader public or researchers in South Africa. So the Ugandan one is the second on the continent in our understanding. And there's also a short video explaining what the, what the lab is about. All right, so the Winter School was the second one I wanted to uh, talk about. So this was um, an initiative that the institution did together with uh, Stellenbosch University in, uh, and the Southern Africa Towards Inclusive Economic Development Program, SA Tide for short. Uh, so uh, uh, there was an open call. We had uh, more than 300 applicants. Only 10% only or less were selected, so that was very competitive. Uh, 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 we had, of course, academic early career researchers, but also uh, representatives from, from revenue authorities, um, um, finance ministries, and, and, and research um, institutes. Uh, the course consisted of an intensive uh, 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 data uh, and, 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 and statistical methods bootcamp that was online, and then one week of lectures and practical sessions um, uh, in, um, uh, in South Africa in, in, in July 2022. Uh, so we were, we were happy to have some of the uh, course participants participating also in this event and, 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 some of the uh, and, and some of the people who participated in the course actually presented posters um, in the, over the poster session here in this event as well. When it comes to the, to the type of research uh, topics that we have been doing, uh, we have uh, done work, of course, on compliance, tax compliance. So I just list here some of the, some of the papers. These are by no means the, the only papers, and, and, and I, now I notice that there should be also South Africa papers here. But these are just examples of, of what can be done. Uh, so uh, there's a paper examining uh, the revenue impacts of tax examinations in, 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 in Tanzania. Another one on, on, on looking at an, uh, an administrative in, uh, uh, intervention called the withholding value-added tax in the Zambia case and its impacts on revenues from the, from the VAT. As you know, inform informality is a key uh, uh, bottleneck uh, in, 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 in taxation uh, in, in African countries. And, and, and the African revenue authorities have had various uh, programs to try to get more uh, firms and, indi and, 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 and individuals to the tax net. And Maria Jouste and colleagues um, had, uh, has uh, analyzed the success of the Euro uh, of, 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 of her Ugandan taxpayer registration campaign in her paper that I listed here. And of course, in the beginning, I mentioned that the, what, how tax influences um, uh, taxpayer behavior is also key. And uh, here's one example of, so, of such studies uh, where we, together again with Maria, we look at the uh, uh, responses to a tax reform where the uh, progressivity uh, in the personal income tax system was increased and how that then influenced revenues and inequality, post-tax inequality in the country. So, Denise, that was my uh, hopefully uh, short enough introduction, and I'm now looking forward to hearing from the panelists on, on, their, th on their thoughts on, on, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Yuka, for those uh, introductory remarks and actually for opening up a bit for those of us who may not have known the details a bit more about how UNU Wider has been working with tax authorities in terms of research uh, in uh, the sub-Saharan Africa region and perhaps on a broader scale as well. Uh, it's now my uh, role to introduce you to our panelists and I will introduce you uh, one by one. And when I do, please um, make your way up to the stage. But perhaps I should uh, start with our one remote participant, and that is Ezekiel Piri. He is the Director of Research and Corporate Strategy with the Zambia Revenue Authority. He's a tax administration and policy expert with over 15 years' experience. 
He's a short-term expert for the International Monetary Fund in Tax Administration, and he's previously worked in academia and lectured in undergraduate courses. Welcome, Ezekiel. Okay, let us hope that Ezekiel has heard our welcome. Hi, Ezekiel. You're there. I okay. can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon. Wonderful. Great to have you. Great to, to see that the communication link has been properly established. That's one down. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Alan Nathanga, who is the Assistant Commissioner for Research and Innovations at the Ura Uganda Revenue Authority. She's worked on major ICT projects, such as the Integrated Tax Administration System, which led to the introduction of e-filing and online payments, and the Data Warehouse Business Intelligence Project that aimed at integrating data and enhancing data analytics and usage in URA. Alan has a strong personal vision of using research as a driver of innovations and transformations in tax administration. Please join us on stage, Alan. Uh, I guess uh, those of you who were present in the previous parallel session that took place in this room, you're no stranger to Waziona Ligomeka, Wazi, as he calls himself. He's a tax economist and a member of the United Nations Committee of Tax Experts in International Cooperation. He's got more than 15 years' experience in tax policy, tax administration, and macroeconomic analysis, and he's also focused on modernization of tax administration functions in developing countries. Please join us on stage, Wazi. Last, but certainly not least again, we have Ingrid Willard. She's a professor of economics at Stellenbosch University and honorary professor of economics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She served as a member of the Davis Tax Committee in South Africa, which advised consecutive ministers of finance on tax reform for inclusive growth. Ingrid is strongly committed to providing research-led policy advice. It's great to have you all. I'm not sure why we have an extra chair, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's imagine that Ezekiel is, is there in spirit. Well, let's uh, just get warmed up with an opening question that I hope each of you uh, can address. And again, let's start with Ezekiel, who uh, would be great to see on one of the screens here if, uh, if our technical team can figure that out. Uh, Ezekiel, can you hear us? Yes, no. yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. I can hear you. Great. So here's a, a, a question for you. Great. We can see you now as well. Uh, I'd like for you to give me your impression on the whole question of tax authority research collaboration as it stands in your region now. Well, it's, um, it's quite a loaded question. Uh, thank you very much for that question, but quite loaded. And I hope I can um, I can do a bit of justice in terms of uh, explaining um, the the perspective that you have uh, you've just asked me to do. So I think the groundwork has already been laid down by the professor in terms of the collaborative work that UNE wider is doing with revenue administrations. Indeed, I can confirm that um, it, there is some work that is going on currently between ourselves and uh, UNU wider and several others for that matter um, that we are collaborating with in terms of trying to to utilize tax administration data for for research purposes. Um, there are just a few constraints that we we have, which I believe that um, across many countries where this is happening, uh, this could be a bit common. Um, the, the first thing that I would like to, to, to make reference to is, um, the first of all, in our setup, we, we are 
we are privileged to have a dedicated research uh, department with a, a dedicated um, unit responsible for for statistics, which was set up uh, sometime back in maybe 2018, 2019. But the research department has been existing for quite a while. But in terms of the the doing the research that should benefit both internal and external users, it's been quite a, a difficult journey uh, because there are various constraints that we tend to face in, in this space. Uh, the, 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 the first one that I might mention, first of all, is the, the one to do with uh, uh, issues of um, uh, taxpayer confidentiality. Um, in our law, for example, the, the law that establishes the, the revenue authority, there are some very stringent um, provisions that uh, deter the sharing of data with unauthorized persons. And, and, and that is embedded in the, in the law, for example, what we call the Zambia Revenue Authority Act. It's very express in terms of who can benefit or who can um, get the data um, to use either for academic purposes or for other purposes. But what is clear is that the taxpayer information is expected to be kept very confidential. And so that has tended to restrict the sharing of the data um, across the different uses. Uh, from academia all the way up to a uh, uh, policy making level. Um, the, recently, there have been other laws that have been introduced, for example, the Data Protection Act, which was enacted, I think, 20, way back in 2018 in our case. Again, it has got very stringent um, requirements and it protects uh, um, um, uh, micro data from being shared with unauthorized persons and the penalties are quite stiff. So when it comes to that, you notice that over time, we've not had, we've had challenges with uh, the aspect of, first of all, beginning to, to share the data for wider use. But this has been overcome lately by the signing of the MOUs and also the putting into place uh, of instruments such as the non-disclosure agreements. When you do this memorandum of understanding, you tend to put in place the non-disclosure agreements that tend to make sure that you are able to share this data without worrying so much of the breach that you can cause to the, to the data protection laws that are in place. So that, that's been really the, the, the first and foremost, the, 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 the most difficult uh, aspect in terms of sharing. But also the aspect of having very small um, uh, research departments or research units has also contributed because we've tended to focus mostly on um, internally driven uh, uh, research that is just maybe meant to benefit management and also maybe policymakers to a limited extent, but we've not been able to really share or utilize the data that we have to a, a very large extent in terms of now making it, making use of it in the manner that we are we are beginning uh, to make use of it, especially like in the collaboration that we're having uh, with um, with institutions like UNUIDA. And thanks to the recent um, um, a collaboration that we've had and we've done like the professor had indicated in the introduction, we've done quite a number of, 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 of uh, studies uh, together and we have a number of them planned for implementation this year and getting into the other year. But what, right. what immediately also comes uh, to mind, oh, sorry, may I, yes please. Yes, thank you so much. I think that you've laid out very clearly what are the primary challenges that you face in terms of the research collaboration that we're talking about here today. So for example, uh, access to taxpayer data, which of course is subject to very stringent uh, confidentiality rules and the ability to effectively share data. And Yuka actually did talk about the fact that um, in the research 
uh, protocols, you tend to use anonymized data. So I'm, I'm quite sure that there are solutions uh, possibly around the, the difficulties that you face. But now I would like to turn to uh, Ingrid and Wazi and Alan uh, in turn to tell me about some of the challenges that you face when it comes to uh, engaging in the research and the sharing of data, uh, for example, that Ezekiel referred to, and effective collaboration. No, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting to think back um, to, to where we started this process in South Africa. So, you know, it's, it's been almost 10 years that, uh, since, since we started discussions with the South African Revenue Services around why making data available to researchers would be useful. And um, I happened to be in some of those conversations because we'd set up a secure data center at the University of Cape Town for our household survey that I had been the PI for. And I still remember that very first discussion with, with SARS where the question was, well, why would one want to use tax data for something that isn't a question just about tax compliance? And when I think where we are today, 10 years later, we've worked through all of these issues around how do we anonymize the data properly? How do we ensure that there's proper capacity? Um, we're now in a completely different, different space. So perhaps to, to talk about a little bit about where, we are, where we're at today. So today there is a secure data center which sits um, at the National Treasury uh, with, some, with collaboration from the revenue services, a lot of support from you and you wider. There are data scientists, there's research staff on the ground. There's this amazing facility that researchers can go into and get fully supported. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that that didn't just happen, right? I mean, it sounds easy, but it was 10 years of gradual work of working up to this point, point where we're at today. But we're now in a position where, where the facility exists, everybody can see the value. We're not still having conversations around, um, you know, why would, why would one want to make this data available to, to non-revenue uh, non authority staff? But it required changes in legislation. It required an enormous amount of effort to, um, to, to think about ways of anonymizing, for example, top incomes to, to ensure confidentiality. So there was this, this huge amount of, of, of effort that required political will. And I have to say, at some points along the process, we went through, in, those, in that 10-year period, we've, we've had eight ministers of finance, I think. Um, some of them were, certainly would have supported this program, not all of them would have supported the program. And so it, it really required a monumental amount of effort from the research community, from the revenue authorities, and from the Ministry of Finance to actually realize this, this vision. But um, today, you know, we have this facility, we have many papers not only being written on, 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 on taxation, but papers that are of, of enormous value to, to policymakers and the research community. And yeah, I think we can come back to some of those issues, I'm sure, Denise. Thank Absolutely, you. we definitely will. Wazi, what's your view on the ground? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I share the same sentiments uh, in terms of uh, uh, how do we start sharing this data to collaborate with others outside the tax administration. And I have to say, for Malawi, we haven't quite reached that stage yet. You know, we are still trying to look at the, our regulations, our laws, to see uh, will we be able to start sharing the micro data at the individual level with others. So that has been a challenge in collaborating with others. Uh, but I want to add other aspects uh, that uh, we've made in using the, the, the administrative data. And uh, the first one, the others have been already you know, highlighted uh, uh, in, in terms of the capacity of the people sitting in the maybe research departments. Uh, are they able, we are generating all this data, but do we have the capacity to analyze it? Mm -hmm. What is this data saying? So it becomes very important when you are collaborating with the research institution or the academia you know, in, in terms of understanding what the data is saying. Uh, the other challenge that we are facing is the linkages between the data in the tax administration. So you would have um, domestic data that is not linked with the customs data. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes you would want to see if, for example, someone has imported a shop, 10 TVs, and then when they are reporting, they've reported domestically they have sold two TVs, but they don't have any TV remaining in the shop. Mm. Where did the ATVs go? <laughs> but we really don't have these linkages even within the tax administration of the, 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 the data on what is happening. So these are some of the limitations. Um, the, these linkages would also go even to other uh, uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. There's an institution that is registering businesses and you are collecting a, a, a tax data, but you're not linked. So you don't know who is doing business because some are in the informal sector, yet they have a business registration. Uh, we are not quite linked and we don't know how to find them. Uh, lastly, I think what I want to highlight is the issue of the, the tax data, is the, the administrative data, is data that we will find because uh, someone is registered with the revenue authority. They are filing a tax return, they are making tax payments, so we are generating this data. But for developing countries like my country, Malawi, you have a whole lot of individuals who have lots of income, but maybe they're not registered mm. with the tax uh, administration. Mm. So we'll be missing out on this aspect. So the data, yes, is there, it's very useful, uh, but sometimes you would want to get more, but you don't have it. Uh, so yes. it's still uh, limited to, to some extent because it's just covering those that are uh, formal and uh, registered. I think for this, I should stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wazi. And uh, we actually were discussing, we had a, a, a mini panel before the panel where we discussed the fact that a lot of the issues that we might be getting into during this particular conversation would already have been covered during the previous parallel session. But I think it's bare repeating some of these issues and perhaps open them, opening them up from different perspectives. Um, Alan. Uh, tell us about your challenges. Wazi talked about fragmentation of data, also um, perhaps fragmentation in terms of the way institutions work. Uh, is that something that you're seeing in terms of your work? Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, um, before going into the challenges, um, talking about how you are a, we started on the journey of collaborating. For us, it was more of um, a mutual um, interest and mutual benefit. As you are a, we are always challenged to do more, to collect more, raise the tax to GDP, and uh, inform policy. We are always asked questions by our supervisors. And on the other hand, we always had these people um, different agencies, different researchers coming to request for our data. So uh, for us, it was, um, um, uh, it was a natural kind of um, um, realization that we needed each other. We needed the collaborations. And the way we've uh, been, we collaborate with individuals as well as institutions. And the way we do this is we normally uh, work through a memorandum of understanding and we jointly agree on uh, what we want, to, the research agenda. So once we set the research agenda, which is mutually beneficial to the authority as well as uh, in the interest of uh, the party, then uh, we can set it moving. And then with studying, of course, uh, there have been a couple of challenges. Mm. We've done many joint researches, but um, yes, then you realize uh, specifically the issue of uh, data confidentiality and privacy. Um, we needed um, to find a way of sharing the data without disclosing the individuals. And of course, um, this, we, we went through non-disclosure agreements, MOUs, but still, um, at the beginning, most of the data would be sharing would be at aggregate level, so that the individual is not, um, you can't easily tell the individual taxpayer. Um, uh, but then, uh, as we, we kept going forward, but maybe before that, when you think about data, it's an output from a process. Um, uh, revenue authorities generate this data as they are just uh, managing their normal process. So there are moments when you change the process. Mm. There, are, um, for example, you have a new process, a new way for efficiency, and that would impact the data. 
So there would be challenges of data quality, or at least uh, the collaborating agencies would think that uh, now there are these fields missing, but the actual point is that uh, the process has changed. And so um, to walk around that, there was always need, you needed to work with a local researcher, mm -hmm. uh, a person within the authority who appreciated the process, to let you know that now there's a new process, and from this new process, this field is no longer uh, a requirement, and uh, that goes on from time to time. Um, yes, uh, out of that, the need of uh, working together and making sure that we have this resource um, of, of data available without disclosing the individual, that's how then the concept of um, the research lab uh, uh, came to birth. So uh, it, it was, uh, we, we both were benefit, benefiting because um, in each collaboration, you, you first, uh, we have guidelines and you have to share, you're mandated to share your findings with us before you put it out. So that way we could be able to uh, undertake quality research. You would complement our resource, our resources. And I must say that uh, within our research um, uh, division section, we have very few people, yet we have a lot of work to do. So it was um, a good opportunity. Then you work with the different research networks and you just agree on what agendas, what to research about. And yeah, you help them make sure that uh, they appreciate the data from the process perspective. The taxpayer uh, details are not revealed. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, we, we quickly get many researches completed and many tight um, um, knowledge, some information really coming out very fast with our limited resources. So it, that has been our journey. That's how we, we came to realize that uh, the way to go is really collaborating. Mm -hmm. And we collaborate with individuals as well as uh, different um, agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. I think that's got a really positive feel to it, that there are these challenges, but in the end, there can be a win-win-win or win-win-win, depending on the number of partners that you're working with. But one thing that I'm hearing coming out of this conversation is uh, one of the issues, if not challenges, facing individual authorities um, and bodies is one of capacity. So uh, I think it was Wazi who talked about um, a shortage of analysts, people to really interpret data. Uh, and Ezekiel, is this something, uh, if I turn to you, that is affecting you in terms of the work that you're doing in your country? Um, <clears throat> yes, please, uh, moderator, thank you very much. Th this is really one of the... Um, one of the issues that is affecting us. Uh, first of all, the, um, the number of uh, people that need to work on these complex assignments is one of them on its own, but also just the experience and the capacity of the, of our, the officers that we have. So we require constant training um, um, of officers, but even in the presence of uh, uh, training that the institution offers, it cannot match the capacities that have been built by specialized institutions that we've been collaborating with uh, lately. So I think the, the way we've tried to overcome uh, this challenge, both in terms of numbers and in terms of the experience, um, in terms of what you can do with the data, we've, we've really tried to maximize on working with collaborating partners so that the experienced researchers that come from these institutions that are, are, are dedicated, they've got dedicated resources to deal with this, who then um, uh, help our researchers to begin to learn some of the techniques that they may not uh, exactly be having. So indeed, this has been one of the limitations, but we've overcome it lately by collaboration with institutions like UNU wider and the others that have come on board to try to to, 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 to get to use uh, some of the very rich data that we have. Uh, except that uh, some of this data, in terms of the periods that, that we cover, it may also be a bit shorter than what you would normally want to have because we've been changing systems from one period to the other. And so in terms of consistency of quality, you end up having 
a lot more challenges, but I think we've overcome that by uh, the kind of collaboration that we've been having. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Ezekiel. Uh, if I come to you, Ingrid, I feel like I'm just going, going to, to, you know, but so please feel free. <laughs> it's uh, the thing on my left, you know, to the left, to the left. Uh, please feel free to interject and, and, uh, and uh, add your contributions to your, to your colleagues' comments. Uh, one question I do have in mind, when we're talking about um, uh, tax administration or tax authority research collaboration, in sub-Saharan Africa is that I would like for you to share with our audience uh, concrete examples of that kind of collaboration that has resulted in tax policy, either new tax policy or changes in tax policy. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> for it's example. A, it's, a t it's a tough one. You know, tax policy changes very, very slowly, right? Um, even, if one, if, even if one has a robust finding, you know, to then, and even if you, there's political will to change something, it, it, it takes time. So uh, even, even after 10 years of this type of work, I'm not sure that there are so many examples, mm -hmm. but let me give a, a couple of small ones. Um, so one is that in, in 2014, South Africa introduced um, an employment tax incentive for young people. And that work had been based on a randomized controlled trial, which has subsequently been quite contested. And you know, I don't want to criticize the author of that paper, but you know, it, it, it wasn't a real world example of, 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 a, of the rollout of the actual program that happened. But obviously there was you know, an employment tax incentive for young people in a country with massive youth unemployment mm -hmm. is obviously an attractive thing to do. There have now been quite a, quite a number of papers using the, the tax data sitting in the secure data center, which are contesting the original findings and saying, well, actually, it's not obvious that this, that this tax incentive is doing what it's meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, the econometric difficulties are, are certainly there. And, and I think what's, what's been exciting is that we now have several papers using quite different methods and quite sophisticated, which are all questioning whether, whether there's a real result. Now, that hasn't yet resulted in the employment tax incentive being binned, right? I mean, I think that is an incredibly difficult thing to do. But I think it's certainly adding to a stock of evidence that would not have been possible in the absence of, of, of the secure data center. So perhaps that's an example of something where I think it's gonna eventually lead to some, to some adjustments, but it hasn't happened yet. Right. Um, Please go ahead, Alan. Thank you, I could come in there. It may not be, um, to change tax policy, it could be more than one papers to do that. Mm. But there are some uh, benefits from uh, an administrative perspective. From uh, research findings, um, there are those things that uh, as a revenue authority, we take on and we implement and um, they result into um, uh, benefits, really, additional revenue. Um, the most outstanding one is um, that the issue of the research lab. Um, out of realizing that um, um, we have many data quality issues and uh, we could, uh, each time you carry out a research, you can do some data cleaning, you can then um, make it available for the different researchers. Then uh, there's another research we did uh, on the high net worth individual just to see how well are we taxing them. And that, uh, the recommendations from that were really implemented. So we ended up having um, a criteria, um, thinking through a criteria for defining who is a high net worth individual, and of course reviewing it from time to time, and then setting up a high net worth individual uh, section. So. They may not, policy changes sometimes take time, but they are those obvious low hanging fruits um, which really come from the research recommendations and findings. Sometimes for policy, you need more than one, one papers. And um, um, there are opportunity, there are moments when uh, we just pilot or run a proof of concepts of some of the uh, recommendations. And based on the findings from there, then, uh, um, uh, bigger government and policymakers is be able to move forward and, and, and implement change. So, yeah, there have been so many benefits, but um, it's um, difficult to say this paper, then this policy change. Sure. That is not uh, uh, very possible. Thank you. Please go ahead, Wazi. And I do understand that it's difficult to draw a straight line 
between one bit of research and yes, this, this new law, this new policy came into effect. Please go ahead, Wazi. No, thank you. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the collaboration that we have in Malawi, it's not mostly with the, you know, someone outside, but we have a good collaboration between the tax administration and the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. And I find this to be very useful. I'll give you an example. Sometimes the minister would say, can I increase the zero bracket uh, band for pay as you earn uh, by this amount? And maybe the revenue loss is, say, 40 billion. Then uh, uh, the, 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 the revenue authority will say, that's too much. We'll not be able to meet this target you're giving us. Then together we say, okay, where, how can we uh, generate the same revenue from somewhere else? Then we say, well, maybe let's uh, introduce VAT on some financial transactions that are IT in nature. Mm -hmm. They are not really uh, uh, financial in nature. So we have uh, been working together the research department within the tax administration and the policy division within the Ministry of Finance. We do collaborate and work together, especially on analyzing policy options. And I found this to be very beneficial because we understand where they're coming from and what we are trying to do, so it makes it easy to present it to the minister. So that's a bit of a collaboration that we're doing internally that I find useful, but uh, hopefully we'll get where we are collaborating with the outside. But I thought I should bring that perspective. That's great. I love that example because it sounds like you're working backwards. <laughs> Alan. Um. Yes, um, some of the collaborations are really, again, across the different revenue authorities. Mm -hmm. We have um, organizations like um, the ATAP. We, have, uh, um, uh, we always collaborate. So what the collaborations have done is avail this wealth of information, knowledge, which you can always uh, reference because um, there are occasions when um, um, you have a challenge and all you do is to research within the different networks. Is there any research that has been done? It could have been done in a different revenue agency or within a, a different uh, collaborating body. And you pick this information and uh, you reuse it here and there. And that has been beneficial. Yes, of course, uh, some collaborations are directly with the ministry, with intergovernment agencies, but as well as uh, the different revenue authorities. Uh, it sounds, sorry, please go ahead, Ingrid. So I wanted to jump in on this example about the, the simulation models, because I think it's such a great example of where one can use data that comes out of this it comes out of the, the confidential data that sits in the research lab or at the revenue authority, but you can then quite easily translate that into a, a into an Excel-based model mm -hmm. that you can then distribute very very broadly. So you know, so there, there are these wonderful examples now across sub-Saharan Africa, and 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 I mean, there was a workshop the day before this this conference about how how to build those models, mm -hmm. and. You know, that, that's a beautiful example of where you're not requiring people to come in and use the confidential data, but you build something based on that that's quite easy to update, um, and then you dis disseminate it broadly. Mm -hmm. And so we've certainly seen, seen wonderful dissemination. Um, Nuki Stain is, is, is here in the audience, where we've been able to do training sessions f across other government departments, mm -hmm. such that they begin to understand much more about how how that how the tax base is constructed and how you can simulate these these tax changes. So you know I think that there are these great examples across the region of, of things that you can do that don't necessarily require this big scary data center um, necessarily. It sounds like there's already a great deal of very positive collaboration among the different kinds of authorities and and ministries of finance and so on. But do you uh, feel that there might be more room or is there room for improvement when it comes to the uptake of research uh, in terms of policy making? The floor is open. Okay. Please go. Yeah. Um, for the others that have already started, you know, these uh, collaborations, I think um, they are really open. Uh, but for, for countries like mine, I, I think there's a lot of room. Um, 
One is this whole aspect of uh, creating dedicated units mm -hmm. that will be conducting uh, this research, uh, managing the data, cleaning it, uh, making sure it's in a well usable uh, format, uh, the, the, the data lab in other country that they are creating. I think that, that would produce data or put the data in a format that even can be used by others uh, and develop the models that can be shared with others. So definitely there's that room for increased uh, development of things like that. Um, capacity building, uh, it's uh, always a good uh, area where we can improve on uh, uh, the use of data for um, countries, and I love this collaboration. Why is the UN, you, why they're not in Malawi already? I saw the four countries that did not see Malawi. I was like, why? When are you coming? So that's the kind of a collaboration that we need mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well, and it's really helpful. I, I, I like that idea, working with these institutions. Even on the, how do we start using this uh, sensitive data, uh, uh, the institutions like this can help us. This is how other countries are doing it. Yes. Uh, we've heard it's a long process, uh, but maybe we're stuck, we don't know where to start. They can come in and say, this is how you can, and then we start that discussion. So they, 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 there is room, I think, for improvement, especially in these areas, um, capacity building and collaborating with other institutions for uh, countries that are not yet uh, doing it. Okay, please go ahead. Um, yeah, right. in terms of, um, um, room, of in, room for improvement, yes, there's room for improvement. One, uh, specifically with the, um, the research lab, we, we feel, why do researchers have to move to Kampala to use the lab? Why can't we avail it online? Why isn't it virtualized? Um, um, make it easy for them as well. That is a room, an area for improvement, and we're already working with you and you wider on a, a feasibility of having that. But then another one is, um, um, for example, in URA, we collaborate with a couple of organizations. You and you wider, then you have ICTD, then you have EPRC, and sometimes um, you, um, we have researchers from all these different institutions at the same time. So another room for improvement, and I've always wondered, is there a way um, these other bodies who we are collaborating with can also harmonize, kind of like the kind of researches they want to do? Is it even possible that then, uh, so we all sit on one table with all our four people we are collaborating with and develop one big research agenda and, um, but that never happens. Everyone comes on their own. Now, the reason why this is important is um, we already said that uh, as a revenue authority, we have very few, um, we have resource constraints in terms of persons managing the research. And uh, for each collaboration, of course, um, the internal staff have to be involved for purposes of um, uh, clar uh, clarifying issues about the process, etc. If we had uh, one common table where we can all sit and um, we are different institutions and we talk about this, it would be easier for mm -hmm. the revenue authorities um, to manage these uh, multiple collaborations. Um, I think that's an area of improvement. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you don't need a conference for that. You need a, <laughs> you need a forum. Um, and I, I think the, the, the question that I have in my mind next sort of relates to the issue of, um, that Alan raised about why do, why does someone have to go to Kampala to use the data? And uh, Wazi, you talked about, um, about data and data analytics and so on. And leapfrog, but be sure you land. <laughs> That's not mine. I heard it yesterday. Uh, thank you. Someone said it yesterday, and I thought it was a very intriguing statement. So that expression I heard, and of course, it conveys the idea that uh, it's possible for uh, developing economies to just just bypass all of those laborious steps that other more developed uh, countries have taken in terms of technology usage, for example, and, uh, and just use the next best thing that's already out there. And I think that technology is increasingly uh, moving to the center of the work that you do in terms of uh, research and in terms of using large data sets and, and so on. 
So I'm coming to the question, hold on. Uh, how would you describe your current capacity for using technology and data and, and very cutting edge technologies and data in your respective areas? Ezekiel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by Ezekiel. When you are in the virtual, when, when you are in the virtual environment, you can easily be forgotten. But um, I, <laughs> I, I, I still have a hangover in terms of the, the other question that was being discussed, in terms of the, the, the areas of improvement. Um, before I come to this question, if I may be allowed briefly, sure. there's this aspect of uh, dissemination. Um, Effective dissemination, I think the last workshop we had with UNE wider which involved a number of government institutions and also was quite a bit publicized in the, in the media, is one area where we can keep improving on to ensure that there's proper buy-in from all the stakeholders, uh, government and non-governmental uh, stakeholders, to ensure that they understand what is going on and what benefits can come out of these collaborative uh, arrangements, which are very beneficial. The gap studies that we did and, were, and, 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 and the outcomes were publicized, I think attracted quite a lot of attention from the policymakers. And even as we were making some decisions regarding some, some restructuring within the organization, I think the gap studies turned out to be very useful in uh, very useful input in informing the decisions on where to deploy resources better because it, we already have these studies that have informed us where the gaps are in terms of uh, collecting. So I think they've been quite useful on a practical end. But coming to the question of uh, use of technology and also the uh, issues that come in there, we've noticed that also... Um, the, 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 there's a lot of opportunity, especially when you do the, you, you, you warehouse your data, you put it in a warehouse. So, for example, we have a, a fully fledged project that uh, we are calling Bulk Data Intelligence Analytics uh, uh, System, which has put together um, data from our uh, internal revenue tax administration system and also from our, our customs administration system and putting it together. And you know that to analyze this data, you cannot analyze it on spreadsheets or on, 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 on simple technology. I think you require more advanced technology to begin to make good use of this information. So lately we've built this engine and we are having to move to a, a, a situation where we now need to utilize more technology to begin to connect the information. I think one of my colleagues here had mentioned the issue of um, making sure that the data is speaking to each other. So to get to that level where you need to, to put this information together to, to begin to make sense across different sectors, especially with the interfaces that we are doing now with other institutions, talking about use of third party information and how we can make good use of it, I think Technology, uh, emerging technologies like AI, I think, come in handy uh, to, 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 to begin to simplify some of the issues that you may be facing in terms of um, uh, analyzing the information. So I think there's wider opportunity in that space. But it also, if I may be allowed, it also created a bit of a challenge in terms of the governance framework around all this. So we realized that when we we had all this data put together. We had no framework for governing uh, the use of the information. As the information is getting used, who has access to this data and so on. So we were working from, we were kind of working um, upside down, like you are, you, are, you are beginning to now do some kind of firefighting. We were putting in a data governance framework where after we've had all these uh, issues already put in place. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of sanitize the environment and make sure that we are, we are making good use of it. So there's scope 
for utilizing uh, modern technologies to deal with this. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'm hearing Ezekiel saying that there's lots of opportunities to use uh, data and technology, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you have to have the right frameworks in place to manage it uh, correctly. Ingrid, would you like to weigh in here? Yes. I mean, I, I actually think it was one of the mistakes we made at the outset when we started talking to the revenue authorities about about the data, you know, I think we were a little bit, as researchers, we were quite cavalier and we were like, you've got this amazing data, we can, we can do all these things with it. And I think the revenue authorities were rightly very cautious about that and said, well, this is highly sensitive data. We are, we are obliged to keep all this information confidential and we need to think very, very carefully about how we manage that. And the more data you start to merge in, and I think that is the exciting frontier, is to say, well, let's also merge in the education records, let's merge in the unemployment data, let's merge in the death records and the, the birth records, and then you can start to do all these exciting things with, with the observation, with you know, records for people that are not in the tax data. Mm -hmm. But the more you do that, the more complicated it becomes, the more important it is that you have a governance framework. And you know, there are cap capacity constraints here. But one, one needs, this is, this is tricky work to, to, it's tricky data to work with, and one has to be responsible in, 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 in ensuring that, it, that the researchers are using it appropriately. And so, I, you know, I don't want to sound as though I, I don't think one should put data out, out there, but it's, it's, it's not an easy overnight mm. task. So I think one has to move, move slowly. I think, that, I think we'd all agree that it would be wonderful if more researchers could access the data, but one needs to think very carefully about how one does that. Yes, you may, Alan. Thank you. Um, talking about technology, yes, um, at URA we've tried to optimize technology to make it easy for um, taxpayers to simplify our processes and create efficiencies. Of course, uh, with each uh, process automation, you, you generate a lot of data. And what we've done really is um, to try and make use of this data internally by drawing um, um, through data analytics, draw some um, indicators, BI, indicators to alert you to help you manage compliance better. We, we realize that um, uh, without technology, it's almost impossible to, to know who the taxpayer is, who are they dealing with, to have that visibility of who they are, and also to identify who is not compliant. Mm -hmm. Because everyone, we have a self-declaration regime. Um, everyone will submit their return. And then how do you quickly know that uh, this return is likely to be wrong? So at least technology has helped us um, do um, much data here and there and throw flags or indicators of um, possible um, non-compliance. Mm -hmm. But as you say, technology is always evolving. There's always a new, a better way, a new tool, a new uh, idea for managing the data. So uh, it's, um, it's a continuous improvement, if I may say. And also um, then uh, the, the skill sets. You need to continuously grow the skill sets of uh, your team to be very analytical, to optimize this data. And um, with time, you realize that the data you have internally as URA is not sufficient. Then you need to, to bring in other data sets from other, maybe utility companies, uh, maybe other, now we're talking about the automatic exchange of information to kind of uh, make the best, optimize and identify where the missing uh, revenue could be. Now, um, technology in terms of researching, Yes, um, uh, the research um, um, has helped us um, because uh, the different researchers, the international researchers, sometimes have more skills in analyzing data. They know that they are more advanced in some packages they are working with. So again, we take, um, we leverage that. Mm -hmm. We learn from them here and there. That's what we've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, um, I think not much for me to add, really, because. Um, as I've said, uh, we are generating this data. We have all this uh, wonderful technology. We have um, electronic fiscal devices, so we know when people, someone buys a good somewhere, we have the information there, and we have e-filing, e-payment, um, but really, I think we haven't quite started uh, utilizing it. Mm -hmm. um, but the information is available, it's there. 
So we're looking forward to the collaboration. <laughs> I'm that's sorry, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's the next frontier. Now, I am mindful of the fact that we've gone over the time uh, in terms of the clock, not in terms of the time allocated for the conversation, and that's because we did start a little bit late, and I took the liberty, did not ask for permission, uh, asking for forgiveness uh, that uh, I claimed back the 10 minutes. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to the floor for anyone who has any questions, and I see one question immediately in row four. Thank you very much. I mean, I hope it's okay that, it's just, that there's a slight element of commenting uh, in it. Uh, my name is Finn Taub. I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I, I, I'm reacting um, to sort of a couple of dimensions of, 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 of the discussion. One is, uh, why should one go to Kampala? Um, and the other thing is, oh, can you point to your specific research having changed the policy? Um, and I'd like to, to sort of uh, try to see whether I can uh, say that, look, at the very core of these types of collaboration, there needs to be an element of trust, mutual trust. And you are not going to get that mutual trust if you don't go to Kampala mm. as a, as, as a, a, a collaborator from the north or whatever you want to formulate it. So you need to be there. And that cannot be done in virtual conferences. Virtual conferences can be great tools for communication in many ways, but the actual building of that trust will only happen once you are there. So that's sort of one reaction to why do you need to go to Kampala. It's not just a question that there are confidentiality things and so on where you need to be in the lab and so on, but it's, it's that broader how do you actually develop effective collaboration and mutual respect? Now, let, let me try to um, move that uh, sort of as aspect up to the relationship between the researcher and the policymaker. How can you actually have a trustful relationship if the researcher will constantly run around looking for taking the credit for what is actually the policy maker that should take that credit. So, I mean, however much I do understand from years of experience in interacting with donor agencies and so on and so forth and the pressures they are under and so on, I really am reluctant here. I, as a researcher, I try to do my research, I publish it in as good journals and books and so on as I can, but I leave the credit to the policymaker. Let he or she take that credit. Also take the blame for when things go wrong. But I really need, in order to have a trustful relationship with senior policymakers, I need to leave them to take the credit. It's not for me as a researcher to say, ah, I changed your mind because that's not going to lead to a trustful relationship. Mm. And I do believe that at the core of these exercises that are going on, also in relation to what Ingrid said about the sensitivity, the difficulties, the confidentiality and so on, you are only going to get over those bumps or over those challenges if you have that fundamental trust among each other. And African countries have a lot of reason to be skeptical also in relation to the international research community. Because we do see hijackers running around, uh, being there, just taking things out, and then running away, and not being actually part of the capacity resource policy making process. So I hope it's okay I added this as, as, as a comment rather than as a question. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, before I let the panelists respond to your comments, we'll take a question from Rose. Yeah, um, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, I think there's a lot to, to, to learn. And uh, I, I just want to uh, try to see uh, the, the thinking that would be there 
in terms of uh, doing uh, or co-creating a, a research work, yeah? um, having a system that would uh, help um, uh, the institutions uh, to identify uh, policy questions and work together with the policy makers. And I like what uh, uh, Finn has uh, said. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, I know we have um, a project that we are implementing and uh, f because we are working together with the uh, policy makers, of course it's not, uh, uh, the data is not as much as you're saying, uh, but we have kind of a framework of saying this is how we are going to identify policy questions and this is how we are going to move on in terms of uh, research. And I think if, if, you, if you have maybe such kind of uh, a system put in place, uh, I think it would uh, help you in terms of ensuring that it is not anybody just bringing in even a, a research agenda, that you yourselves are able to define a research agenda that uh, will be beneficial uh, to the institutions. But just wanted to find out whether uh, you have that system of co-creating uh, this, uh, this research work that uh, could benefit from the data that you have. The second element I wanted to find out is, uh, um, I'm imagining a 10-year work uh, of setting up uh, uh, this kind of data, data sets, uh, cleaning up and the like. Um, what kind of investments do you do in terms of, uh, in terms of the systems? Because I'm imagining that uh, you have a system uh, where anonymity is not necessarily done, but you also have a, a kind of a data either management system uh, where anonymity elements are, are done, yeah? I'm just trying to understand uh, how whether there is additional investment yeah? uh, that, is, that, that comes in uh, as uh, the, the two are being done. And then um, the final thing I want to ask is, uh, it's very true, uh, this aspect of systems changing, processes changing, um, and some of us have, have actually been uh, you know, victims of that, that you go, you are being told about uh, maybe data for 10 years ago cannot be gotten because uh, the system was different. As you go about in implementing uh, uh, this kind of a project, what have you learned uh, that going forward uh, you'll be able to have continuity in the way uh, data is actually uh, uh, put together in as much as uh, uh, systems are changing. Uh, is there any effort even to uh, even uh, have a, an in-house in built kind of a system that you know uh, will not be changing much, but will be changing one or two things as, uh, rather than uh, you know, uh, overhauling and having just something very different which is maybe uh, brought in. I'm, I'm just curious uh, uh, that the 10 year work that has been done mm. and uh, a system now comes in, would it have to erase all that effort uh, that has been uh, put? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one more question. Thank you. Amina O'Brien from UNUIDA. So my question uh, to you um, is about the future. What do you want to see in your research collaborations um, or internally or with the data that you have, what do you want to see in five years' time? Where do you want to be in 10 years' time? What is the vision that you have? Uh, do you, yeah, I'll leave it there. Wow. Thank you for that question as well. Uh, let us rewind and start with the first comment from our gentleman there, uh, I think some very interesting observations that he made regarding the issue of trust, the question of trust, um, and actually declaring, yes, we have to go to Kampala uh, if we want to, to build trust and if we want effective collaboration and mutual respect. 
Uh, I see lots of heads nodding. Uh, <laughs> so I think that there is a, that's a no contest kind of issue. But I think the more, uh, perhaps more provocative, intriguing issue had to do with uh, the question of researchers, and I, researchers claiming credit for moving the needle, let's say, as opposed to a pol policy maker, making a decision that I will take this research data on board and I will make a policy decision that will have X impact on, uh, on reven revenue collection and, of course, uh, on people's lives. Please do. Thank you so much for um, all the comments. The first one um, about um, the mutual trust. Um, I'll take it, um, we've been uh, in discussions with um, Finland, they have uh, an online lab, and in their case study, um, they, um, they, they first have the memorandums of understandings and the discussion at institutional level. So you find that um, it's uh, faster institutions agreeing um, to, to open up their data on virtually, and then uh, within the institutions, institutions have persons. For example, we have um, um, an agreement, an understanding with UNU wider, and then it's UNU wider to, to second um, their different persons. Uh, but yes, in uh, many relationships, a virtual country place the face-to-face. -face. Sometimes when you know who you're talking to, um, it's much better that way. But um, um, for bridging that gap, we've been um, thinking about um, really doing it um, at institutional level. Then later on, within the institutions, we have um, the persons. Then uh, um, talking about um, um, uh, taking credit for research work and policy. We have guidelines, and uh, what our guidelines have always been is that um, for many of these uh, collaborative researchers, you need the local um, staff within the authority who understands the processes, who understands the data, etc. And um, our requirement has always been for any publications, of course it, it starts internally within URA, but you've got to recognize to, to add either as a co-author the local um, person who you worked with. Because yes, in a collaboration, still you need the local, the local person to appreci who appreciates the processes and um, um, the actual data for you to um, successfully complete it. Um, and then uh, I'll move on to um, the other question was about what happens if a process changes and you've been working for 10 years and you have all this data. Yes, data is an output of the process. And um, um, the process really is, um, our intent is to simplify tax administration. So as we keep continuously simplifying tax administration, we change processes. And so the data sets are, uh, change. Mm. Um, now what, uh, what we, we've done or what we intend to do, or maybe um, for, we have a data warehouse internally uh, where we, or we uh, again, aggregate this data for um, use of uh, BI. But what we do is that you, you take note of the moment when the process changes happened. Mm. So for example, you say for the last 10 years, this data is, um, uh, the structure of the data is like this, but from this moment forward, because of this um, change in um, um, maybe, in pro yeah, providing efficiency, there's a process change, then, so then the researcher and uh, everyone knows that from this moment on, the data sets, there's a change in the data set. So in a way, you are not losing what you did before in terms of um, aggregating the data and storing it, but you're taking notes, so whoever is using um, knows that uh, there's been a change in the process, so the data is different. There are some fields that no longer exist mm. um, moving forward. Um, then, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Yes. I think uh, Rose's concern had to do, though, with uh, ensuring sort of continuity uh, based on those changes. And Ingrid, you'd like to chime in here. I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick, but I mean, it builds on, on, on this point, and, and I think it, it sort of blends what Finn was saying and what Rose was, was saying. Um, I think economists tend to think of data as it's a public good, right? 
And once you've, once you've put together this data set, you should just put it out there and everybody can use it. And I, th I think the sophistication and the, and the intricacy comes around these, these, these issues around the fact that tax systems change, the variables change, you need metadata to, to explain to you, well, okay, from this year onwards we calculated um, tax credits in a different way. And that, there's an enormous amount of, of that nuanced local information that you need in order to use the data. So I think that goes to this point, partly about data harmonization, but it also goes to the, the question about, about the collaboration and why you can't just put the data out there. And then for Amina's question about, well, how does one institutionalize this and make sure it continues? I think that, that's a really tough question, right? I, I think the, the amount of investment that's gone into setting up these systems is not, is not insubstantial. And yeah, unless the, the revenue authority themselves is, is able to commit in the long run to, to doing that, um, I, 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 don't, I don't really see a future without that, that, mm -hmm. that kind of commitment. It, it can't, there's now been this huge in, in investment from external partners into these centers, but now there needs to be local ownership because otherwise that, all that information about how systems have changed, um, et cetera, will, will be lost to some extent. But it does go to the point of why you have to go to Kampala to, to, mm. to, to do it because otherwise you, you really aren't going to, to, to do justice to the... Exactly. To it. Sorry, and one last question about formulating the questions. I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, that's something we've really struggled with in South Africa. There's been a strong perception from some groups of researchers that there's been gatekeeping, right? That you can't get access to the data unless you've worked through the system. And I think that's a, again comes to this point of why, was, why were these systems set up what is their purpose? And ultimately, the, the, in, the, the purpose of the, of the data centers is to ensure that there is better policy making. And you can't have better policy making without the involvement of policy makers. All right, I would like to bring Ezekiel back into the conversation. You've been sitting, uh, sort of sitting things out for a while. And Ezekiel, uh, I'd like you to address uh, the question that was raised by Rose about uh, uh, the idea of co-creating research work and also uh, the kinds of investments required into research data systems. And finally also, uh, what's your future looking like? What do things look like five, 10 years down the road? Okay, um, so I, I, I think the um the best starting point is what the, the first speaker raised, um, the professor. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the issue about trust, um, mutual trust, mutual respect. I remember it takes me back to the time we were formulating the, the memorandum of understanding with you and you either. We spent a lot of time on the MOU to a point where it nearly collapsed. The agreement nearly collapsed because we, I must, I must be honest here, we were not very sure of the motives uh, behind the, the collaboration. So up until um, there was a give and take, some explanations and so on, because what we put on the table is what's in there for us. So I really like the point, the way it's been summarized. Um, why do you have to go to Kampala? I'll add another town. Why do you have to go to Lusaka? It's for the same reason that you have to gain that trust. So up until we, we've been sitting down with the teams from UNUIDA, we've discussed the concept, we've discussed the ownership of the product, then it becomes very clear that if the researcher is going to take uh, credit, then it becomes a bit problematic. So I, I, I like the way it's been summarized, leave the credit to the policymaker, Again, you would also leave the credit to the to the to the to, to, to the tax administration where it's due, and that's what's going to create benefit for for the administrations. Of course, there's a way in which uh, the, uh, the the collaborators are also going to get benefit, and that's where co-creation comes in. You create something together, but then you co-own it, and but you so so there's that. There's that trust that you 
you, 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 you need to have because people are sensitive about the data and how it's going to be used. Uh, looking at the investment, like you have said, we've invested into these systems for, for quite a long time. It, it's, 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 not, it's not cheap to invest in the, in, the, in the systems, but it's not so much about the cost. I think it's about what is contained in that information and what interpretations and who is going to take the credit out of, out of this. So what, what we would really like to see is, is really what the, 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 the professor has summarized it uh, uh, very well. So we want co-creation, we want ownership, and we also want to get the credit. We want the benefit to accrue to our researchers that as they are working with these uh, experienced researchers, they're also getting the benefit of the training, the benefit of, the, of, 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 of just making sure that there is understanding of this information um, that, 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 that we have our, at, at our disposal. So uh, I, I, I think... Uh, there's no better way to put it in terms of what we would like to see. We would like this mutual respect. I think it's a very important thing that as we work on this, there's this mutual respect and there's the trust. We have to see the real persons. I think that those have been the issues. Like you cannot create this issue over a virtual, a, a virtual arrangement. There must be people behind. You must have clear agreements around these things so that you are able to generate that uh, that, that, that trust that is required. So, so, so for, 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 for going forward, I think we've established these relationships, but what will be more critical is to ensure that uh, even within the revenue administrations themselves, we are looking to making sure that even the subject matter experts are heavily involved in this. It's not just the, the preserve of the research department, it's everyone else in the institution to co-own whatever comes out. So I think there's need for the teams involved in, this, in these products that we are creating to get involved so that there's ownership, there's benefit, there's simplification, because what comes out of what we do, I think we would like to do things much better. Mm -hmm. So if we focus on solutions, I think that's what will, will, will work best for us. So maybe that's how I can put it uh, in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. And Wazi, your thoughts on a bunch of issues. <laughs> I hope you've been taking notes. OK, um, thank you. I think my colleagues have uh, talked a bit more on the first questions. But I want to start with uh, Amina's question. Um, what is the vision uh, for us? Um, for me, I think the key ones that I see are very problematic that I would really love to see happening, especially in Malawi. One is if we are able to have these unique identifiers for individuals and taxpayers, because we have the tipping for the tax administration and then we have the national ID that are used. So to merge the data, to integrate the data, interface, it becomes difficult. In the next 10 years, I think it's happening in Tanzania where they're using the national ID as the tax identifier. I would love to see more countries, especially Malawi, have something like that. Uh, it would make a life uh, and you know, these analysis a bit more easier. Uh, that's one. Uh, second, um, I would want to see more of this collaborative work. There's a lot of potential in raising revenues in most countries. When you look at the policy gap and the administration gap in most countries, it's quite huge. And how do we close those? It's more of this research. Uh, but as you've said, maybe the research, uh, we don't have the capacities. And so this collaboration adds to that capacity, adds to the robustness of the results, uh, which will help us now have policies uh, that will close these gaps. So a more collaboration, uh, I think that I would do uh, very much support. And lastly, I think one of the tax that has a lot of potential for most African countries is the VAT. Uh, the VAT C efficiency for Malawi is at 14%, but I understand for other countries as much as 50%. For African countries, around 30 something percent. 
There is a lot of potential still to collect more revenues from VAT. So I would want more of this research. Where are we missing it? How best do we ensure that when you go to the shop, uh, someone is not asking, do you want a receipt or you don't want a receipt? Well, how do we, and can we, you know, uh, get more from VAT? Um, I think we just, we need a bit more maybe research, uh, but I would want to see in the next 10 years that we have improved on how we are collecting uh, revenues from VAT because I think there's great potential there for most countries. Um, quickly now, I think one more is um, uh, the processes change. Uh, how do we ensure that we're keeping the data? This is a big question. Um, the, the, the My Revenue Authority now in the process of introducing the ITAS, the Integrated Tax Administration System. We are moving from a, we had different systems that we were using, uh, about four of them to, 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 to keep a taxpayer data. But we realized once we started developing the ITAS, we couldn't migrate the information. It was very difficult. So a decision was made to say, we'll just say we are starting from today using ITAS, the historic data, we forget it. We just move forward here so that uh, uh, starting from, say, 2019, that's when we are collecting the data, we go forward. We have lost all these years. The My, uh, the My Revenue Authority started in 20, uh, uh, 2000, but all this data, up to about 20 years of data, we have lost it. So it's a good question indeed, and it's a big consideration. Um, I, haven't, I don't have the answer now, because we failed how to handle that as well, <laughs> other than someone manually inputting it somewhere then we'll see how we can integrate it. I thought I should do, uh, take those two. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we've now reclaimed our 10 minutes that we lost during the break. Uh, so I think it's a good time uh, and sort of a natural, um, uh, a natural opportunity to close this afternoon's conversation, which has been outstanding as always, thanks to our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much, Ingrid Woolard. Uh, Wazi, thank you, Alan Nasanga, and of course, thank you so much, Ezekiel Piri. Um, we've heard about the challenges that are faced by researchers, uh, tax administration, uh, actually tax administration and their research collaboration in sub-Saharan Africa. Many challenges, but also many opportunities as well. And uh, I feel overall a positive uh, sentiment going forward in terms of finding new ways to close the gaps when it comes to revenue collection. So thank you so, so much, all of you. I know the conversations and the work will continue, and uh, we look forward to hearing more of what will come next. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>